we have a unique opportunity today, uh, partly here I'm talking from you know, the heart of uh, Silicon Valley, partly because of the technologies and innovations coming out of Silicon Valley. And we have competing innovations coming from my former state of Texas. And uh, we have a very partisan dialogue about those two things. And the question is, here we are at the 40th anniversary of the 1973 oil embargo. And uh, not to put a differential in our ages, Peter, but uh, I, my recollection of 1973 is having to get up early for school at 5 a.m. so that I could sit in the car with my father who drove me to school and wait in line on the odd days of our license plate uh, for gasoline. And I tell people that uh, as an adult now, I realize that that event made a big impact on me. Didn't seem like it at the time, uh, but I've spent the last 30 years of my life thinking about what we should do so that that would never happen again. That Americans would not get up in the morning and because of the political will of a country far away, we would not be able to go to work, we would not be able to heat our homes, we would not be able to have affordable energy. What did we need to do as a country to make sure that never happened again? And we are really close to being able to achieve that now. And the question really is, are we going to let partisanship divide us? Right? What technologies are available today? What is the role of oil and gas in our future? How do we get to the clean tech vision? Uh, that, you know, state of California and others would like to move us to? Um, and, and, and what's the roadmap for doing that? Um, and one of the mistakes, I think, that was made in the environmental community is there was an assumption that if we somehow just burdened ourselves with very high oil prices, that that would enable solar and all these other innovation technologies that are expensive and it would just magically happen, you know, silver bullet. We'd have this high oil price of $100 a barrel, and then everything else would just work itself out. We'd have solar panels on our homes, we'd plug in our electric car, and off we'd go, problem solved. And the problem is that when you have $100 oil, people who produce oil have the incentive to innovate too. And, and no matter how much money the U.S. government is investing in new technologies, other companies that you know, work in oil and gas, they're investing in innovation too. And so now we've developed a way to produce oil and gas from what I call the source rock. So years ago, we had geologists. They would have to find a trap under the ground, some tiny little pond of oil that they would find thousands of feet under the ground or under the ocean. And they would have to develop all this technology to find this little pond of oil that was under layers and layers of rock. And it had migrated from what they called source rock. So it was trapped in these tiny, 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 tiny holes in rock. And over millions of years, it would pour out into this little pond. And we would have to find the pond. It's like a needle in a haystack. And that is why, you know, we were all paying $100 of oil, because hard to do. And then in the places where we knew it had poured into a pond, like Saudi Arabia or Russia, uh, they had an economic interest in making sure that we couldn't just find every place there was oil and produce it and, you know, we'll uh, have the low price. So they did what they could to put barriers to investment pace so that they would get a higher rent from their oil. But now... The United States industry has figured out a way to actually produce oil and gas from the source rock. And there is source rock everywhere. And part of what's making a controversy in the United States is this source rock is in states that aren't used to having oil and gas production. It's in Pennsylvania. It's in Florida. It's here in California, right? Though we're used to oil production around Bakersfield, but, but it's in states... Ohio, states that we don't think of as oil-producing states, and New York. And so the question is not only can we do this safely and what would the regulations that would be required to do this safely, but if I'm living in bucolic upstate New York, do I even want industrialization near my community? And so we're having difficulty even wrapping our brains around two things. Number one, uh, this high price of oil is bringing more oil. 
and we thought this high price of oil was going to bring clean tech. So what do we do as citizens if we want clean tech? What do we have to do? Because just saying that we're willing to pay more money is not going to be enough because now we're going to have an endless supply, well, not 100% endless, but a very plentiful supply of oil and gas, and we could have a very plentiful supply of oil and gas right here in the United States with all kinds of geopolitical benefits for our country. And the question is, what are our values? Are we committed to clean energy? What are we willing to do about clean energy? If the price of gasoline were to go down because we have so much oil and gas that maybe over time, if things settle down in the Middle East, we could have low oil and gas prices, you know, are we still committed to shift to electricity and other cleaner fuels? What do we want to do as a society? And it's such a transformational period. And that transformation is not only because we're at the pivot of having all these different technologies we could choose from, and then we could send our president, our secretary of state, and our secretary of energy out to China and other places and say, hey, look, do what we're doing. But we have cultural leadership. And the question really is, and I like to say this because uh, I see the faces here in this audience, if I'm 22 or 25 or 18 years old today, what future do I want? How do I want that energy, to, my, my need for energy to be expressed? What form of energy am I willing and wanting to use? And how do I raise my voice to get the energy future that I want? Um, and I see great promise uh, in this millennial generation to look at that issue more carefully. What's my lifestyle? You know, am I going to live in urban density and I'm not going to have a car? Am I going to have a car if I have a car? Um, am I concerned about its fuel efficiency or the type of fuel it uses? These are all questions that I think for the first time in our history, uh, young people are not just accepting the energy infrastructure and the energy system that we've created, but they're interested in social change. And the United States is in a very unique position today, not only with its ability, I think, over time to export oil and gas, but also in its ability to export its social lifestyle. So if young people in this country, you know, vote for uh, new technologies and new ways of lifestyle that use less energy and are less polluting, then other countries will follow us, the young people in other countries, the same way they're photographing themselves with their smartphones and emailing it to their friends just as we are, we can do the same thing in energy from this younger generation. How we use energy is going to be the way that young people in the Middle East and young people in China and young people in Latin America are also going to seek to use energy. And that really is our responsibility to lead.